Our next speaker will be Margaret Lady, who was very instrumental in helping us get out of jail, raising bail and so forth like that. So Margaret, go ahead. Before I get into the bail, I want to talk about one group that tends to be forgotten when we talk about supporters of the strike on campus. And that's the faculty. The first day that we started picketing, there were faculty with us. They stopped teaching their classes and they joined the strike. And what was really frightening for a lot of them was not just the fact that they weren't getting paid, though some of their families didn't like that, being let go. And they were. If you were without tenure, you were gone. So that was a little frightening. But they were there from the first. Later on, the American Federation of Teachers, the faculty union, which had been negotiating with the administration for various issues such as teaching loan, salary, etc. They supported the strike, but they knew they couldn't get Central Labor Council sanction having them support the 15 demands. So what they did was they went to the Central Labor Council with their own demands. They got sanctioned from the Labor Council for the strike. Once that occurred, it was very important because at every entrance to the university where there was a faculty member with a picket sign, no union member would cross. That meant no food deliveries to the dorms. That meant no garbage pickup for those who were still deciding they were going to stay on campus. And it was a major factor in helping us get support outside. In addition, the International Longshoremen Warehouse Union supported the strike and gave faculty members <coughs> on strike who were not getting paid the opportunity to work on the docks and earn money. And some people did. Not all the faculty were capable, but quite a few were. So the faculty were an important contingent as well. My job primarily after walking the picket line during the day and going to the new rallies and running with the cops and occasionally having to hit back, was to go and bail people out of jail. Most of you, I hope, are not familiar with the bail system. But what occurs is you put down 10% of what your bail is, and your bail is dependent upon what your charge is. And you have to get collateral for the rest of it, just in case you skip bail. Well, in, during the strike, we had over 700 people arrested. We raised and paid out $75,000 and had to raise collateral of $750,000. That's a lot of money. And I don't know what it would be in terms of dollars today, but it took a lot of effort to get it. We started out with passing the hat, literally. Bail money, money for bail. But as the strike grew, and in particular as the mass bust occurred, president of the university, Hayakawa, said that two or more people on campus constituted an illegal assembly. Well, of course we had to test that and on January 23rd when we came back from an early Christmas vacation, the strikers went to the free speech area the speaker's platform, and held a rally. The police were all around on campus as usual, and they came and they surrounded 
the people. They just ran, and anyone who could not get out or find their way out, Steve, um, he had a big old two by four, um, was arrested. About 450 people at one time. That's a lot of people. People bail buried. The majority of the people had misdemeanors, 125, 250 each. But if you were injured, you were sure to have a felony. If you were a leader, you were sure to have a felony. And those went up as far as $10,000 each. Most of the money came from the San Francisco Bay Area, family, friends, acquaintances. But with the mass bust, a lot of people who were watching the news heard the phone number of the mail office that people were using to remind each other where to call when they got busted. I'll never forget it. 5522811. And people, radio stations started calling the mail office. And I'm sitting there writing out all the forms because there's a lot of paperwork. And I'm talking on the phone to various radio stations. And we got a lot of money nationally, <clears throat> including a $100 check from Robert S. McNamara. Oh. Anyone know who he is? Yeah. Secretary of Defense. Pardon? Secretary of Defense. Secretary of Defense. He was. He had left by that time. And I think he was feeling guilty. Because he sent a hundred dollars with the proviso that he would cancel the check if we dared to mention his name. <laughs> well, we needed the money, so we didn't care about it. <laughs> One thing that's important during the strike in the mass bust was something that happened to the people in jail. The men and the women were obviously separated into the various cages. And in the women's group, they took one woman and they were putting her in solitary. I can't remember what the issue was. But the rest of the women were not going to allow it without a fight. And they started screaming, on strike, shut it down. They were banging the bars. You could hear them from out of Bryan Street. Well, they got hosed by the guards. They all came out dripping wet. And it's the first time that ever in the media were women seen as part of the strike. Because, of course, all these young women that are dripping wet, the press loves that. But women were active behind the scenes. The men were the faces of the strike. The women were the backbone. As Terry said, as Crutch said, women did a lot of the work, the organizing work, running off the leaflets, not getting to write them. Women ran the bail fund, women ran communications, and women ran legal defense, getting lawyers to work with people after they got out of jail. Women were a major part of the strike, but we were neither seen nor heard by the outside world. And unlike the presidium of the BSU that Terry talked about, there wasn't a top-down effort made to ensure that women got leadership positions in the various organizations. But we were there, and we fought, and we kind of won. <laughs>